Hi, so I'm Paul Mason and I'm from the South Wairarapa Rotary Club and uh, we're coming to you live from Arrow FM in uh, the Wairarapa. We're going to talk today a little bit about um, uh, Rotary International, where it's been, where it's going, the sorts of things that we've been involved with over the years. I have with me today here Brian Baxter, who's our current president. So Brian, perhaps you'd introduce yourself. You can start talking and say hello. Uh, OK, thanks, Paul. Well, hello. Um, yes, Brian Baxter, president of the um, South Wairarapa uh, Rotary Club. Um, I've lived in Wairarapa for about 10 years now, um, and um, I'm sort of a semi-retired um, doing bits and pieces around the place um, and um, we live on a 25-acre um, block just out of Greytown and I'm a sort of a play pretend farmer <laughs> and um, and do other bits and pieces around the um, in, in the community as well okay thanks Brian uh, so talking about the international scene Rotary International it's a global network of around one and a half million neighbours, friends, leaders, problem solvers uh, who see the world where people unite and take action to create a lasting change. Uh, they're around the globe in all sorts of communities and, uh, and in pretty much um, every country in the world. And uh, they have numerous sort of fundamental causes, sort of a list of causes. Uh, fighting disease, providing clean water, uh, ending polio, which we'll talk a little bit about in a minute, promoting peace in a more a, a broader sense, uh, supporting education, saving mothers and children, growing local economies, protecting the environment, disaster response, the list goes on. But Rotary has been championing these causes for many years now. And uh, for instance, with uh, polio, uh, Rotary's been working to eradicate polio now for more than 35 years. Our goal is ridding the world of this disease and uh, the, the uh, completion of that goal is closer than ever. As a founding partner of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, we've reduced polio cases by 99.9% uh, since the first project to vaccinate children in the Philippines, which started in 1979. So far, Rotary members have contributed more than $2.1 billion in countless volunteer hours to protect nearly 3 billion children in 122 countries from this paralysing disease. Rotary's advocacy efforts have played a role in decisions by governments to contribute more than $10 billion to the effort. Today, polio remains endemic only in Afghanistan and Pakistan, but it's crucial to continue working to keep other countries polio flee, free. If all eradication efforts stop today, within 10 years, polio could paralyze as many as 200,000 children per year. So here's a few statistics. It costs $3 to fully protect a child against polio. We vaccinated 430 million. That was a figure from a couple of years ago. And it costs around $100 million a year to maintain the program. Um, we're also uh, the promoting peace effort. I'll get Brian just to talk a little bit about the peace effort while I uh, key up a video which we're going to show you about uh, some efforts that we've taken for providing clean water. Brian. Thanks Paul. Um, today there are over 70 million people displaced as a result of conflict violence, persecution and human rights violations and half of them are children so that's 35 million children. Uh, as Rotarians uh, we refuse to accept conflict a as a way of life. Rotary projects provide training that fosters understanding and provides community uh, communities with the skills to resolve conflicts. Rotary creates environments of peace as a humanitarian organisation, peace is a cornerstone of our mission. We believe when people work to create peace in their communities, that change can have a global effect. We're carrying out service projects and supporting peace fellowships and scholarships. Our members take action to address the underlying causes of conflict, including poverty, 
discrimination, ethnic tension, lack of access to education, and unequal distribution of resources. Our commitment to peace building today answers new challenges. How can we make the greatest possible impact and how can we achieve our vision of lasting change? We are, we are approaching the concept of peace with greater cohesion and inclusivity, broadening the scope of what we mean by peace building and finding more ways for people to get involved. Rotary creates environments where peace can happen. That sounds um, sounds very interesting, Paul. <laughs> okay. Makes me feel if much you're better. you're watching this, there's probably clean water in your bathroom, your kitchen, and your cup. That's not the case for 844 million people worldwide. You can make an impact by joining Rotary's Water, Sanitation, and Hygiene Education Initiative. Together with our partners, we can solve the clean water crisis by 2030. We're already hard at work. Our local Rotary Clubs mobilize community partners and invest in resources to provide clean water, improved sanitation, and training. Our Rotarians are rooted in the community, collaborating with local leaders for long-term change. Each piece of this chain is connected, none more important than the other, but we need every link. We need you. Be a part of the solution. Be a part of 2030. Visit rotary.org slash W-A-S-H. That's better. <laughs> but a slight problem with the uh, with the volume. Um, sorry about that. So um, uh, perhaps if we move to wire wrapper or the uh, rotary wire wrapper or rotary New Zealand, perhaps throughout um, New Zealand now we've got a whole bunch of um, uh, projects underway, uh, especially to do with things like polio, um, the Rotary Young People's Enrichment Initiative. Um, and uh, Medical Innovative Young Minds is another um, uh, initiative for Rotary in New Zealand. Um, global grants and, and so on. So um, throughout uh, New Zealand, all the Rotary Clubs have been doing some quite uh, outstanding programs. And um, I have a couple of uh, videos about some of the programs that they've been up to. Um, uh, locally, our own... Uh, um, the club has been involved in, um, uh, we've had uh, uh, youth awards recently. Hang on, I've got to find the page here. Uh, all right, recent, recent events. We recently uh, gave our uh, Martin Brefair Kuranui bursaries. Every year the Martin Brefair dedicates some of its money to the um, Kuranui College bursary program. And this year we selected out of, we had 12 applicants uh, who were all really well qualified and we chose two which was Micah Smolensky and Melanie Redfern and both of them uh, demonstrated a very clear understanding of their educational uh, goals, how they wanted to achieve them, where they wanted to achieve them and where they wanted to go afterwards. It's quite a difficult job I find um, uh, working through these lists of people who, you know, when we get uh, applicants, many of whom in today's schooling um, I find to be really well educated and uh, have the, the sorts of opportunities that uh, certainly I didn't have in my day. Uh, so they had a, a very clear understanding and so we presented those two they, and they came and presented to us at our meeting uh, the other night um, and again showed themselves to be uh, uh, very uh, well educated. Uh, the, we're preparing for the Round the Bays run in Wellington, which is a fun run or walk, preparing uh, uh, the, uh, for uh, next year. Uh, Tamara Allahand is our local contact for that. She is a, uh, an enthusiastic runner. 
and uh, she's organising that they're going to have all sorts of t-shirts and what have you, uh, caps. Um, we had our food bank appeal recently. Uh, each year Rotary throughout the Wairarapa joined together with the fire service uh, teams in each of the Wairarapa centres and they patrol all the streets as uh, if you're a Wairaparian you would have heard all the kerfuffle uh, picking up food donations for the food banks in each town. Do you know any of the statistics about the food bank, Brian, at all? Um, no. Okay. I, I, all I know is that we collected a lot of um, a lot of food. I was down in Martinborough, and um, and I think we had a well, by all accounts, a record um, um, number of cans of food and all the other things that we get. So um, it, it's quite amazing how much um, the local community comes out and uh, and contributes. And then we took it all around to the Martinborough Food Bank, which and then the other, the other towns do the same, Featherston and Greytown. And I don't know what happens to it after that. I guess it um, gets slowly used by the community. OK, I've got some pictures here of the... Uh, and, and Mike warned me that this would happen. We'd end up fumbling around <laughs> uh, on screen. Uh, but that's all right. We'll handle that. Okay, here are some awardees. I'm going to put these on the screen in a moment. When we go to full screen, there, and so I'm going to show you some of the awardees from the Youth Youth Awards Night. There we go. So here, these are all the um, uh, the students that we awarded to. Where's my next button? There we are. Oh. Okay, and now we're talking about the food bank. That's too small to see. I, I, yeah. Well, there we are, a little bit about food bank. When you talk about the amount of food, food everywhere. In, uh, in Featherston, we were storing in some, a couple of containers and they filled up rapidly. Oh, I should have got bigger. Um, anyway, that's not working. Okay. Moving right along. <laughs> it was a nice thought. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the reasons I got Brian in today was to talk about the year ahead. Uh, he's already had a couple of months to get his feet under the table and um, has already shown that he has some plans in mind for the club. And uh, so I'd like him to perhaps uh, either outline what he's going to do or we can chat about it, whatever, whatever suits you. You want to start with an outline? Yep. Um, uh, I mean, Rotary has this sort of quaint system where they um, have a different president every year, and so um, um, you get 12 months to do what you want to do, and then you're out. Um, and the president has quite a lot of influence on how the club operates, uh, so there is an opportunity to do things, but you only have 12 months, and so um, um, you don't have a lot of time. I started off in July, and of course we were in the middle of all the COVID um, uh, close downs, the lockdowns, and um, the, the first month or two was completely disrupted, and, and the previous president <laughs> had um, all sorts of difficulties as well, because of course the previous president had um, probably four months of um, COVID closures, and uh, and we couldn't meet, and all those sorts of things. So, so. The COVID thing did did teach us um, one important lesson, and that was that at the, our main fundraiser, which is the Martinborough Fair, um, is at risk. For example, if we uh, if we have a, another lockdown, if we move to level two or three or or higher than where we are now, then then we possibly can't hold our Martinborough Fair, and and obviously a lot of um, events around the country have been um, cancelled this year. And Toast Martinborough, for example, was one of those events that was cancelled. So, so we, our, our fears are the two fears that we have every year. That there's a there's a risk that we that we can't hold them, and if we can't hold the fears, then we, um, then our income stream um, disappears. So one of one of my goals this year was to, um, to look for alternative sources of income. We pretty much have um, all our. Um, eggs in the one basket in terms of um, our income and that's the Martinborough Fair and so if that doesn't happen then um, then then our, our 
that we have no income. So we need to find alternative sources of income. So that's one of the things that I'm looking to do um, this year, and, and we've got a couple of um, possibilities that we're working on. They're not going to happen overnight, but um, so that's that's one thing, and that was some, that was a lesson from COVID, I guess. That um, and and I guess there's a lot of community charitable organisations out there that are in the same boat that their their income sources are suddenly either diminished or uh, they they find that they are um, you know that there's a risk associated with their income. So so that was one of the things that I was looking to do just to um, to to try and. Um, make sure that next year we have some money coming in because if we don't have any money coming in we can't do all the good things that we um, that we normally do so um, um, so that was one area the other area was to really follow on again from previous presidents and that was to to modernize our club a little bit to make it a little bit more attractive to um, to people who might be wanting to join it maybe modernize it a little bit more um, Rotary, I guess, is possibly regarded as a a, a an organisation that um, from the past. But there's a lot of work being done to to bring it into um, into the, the the current times. And so that was something that I'm I've been working on and still working on is to try and modernise the organisation, make it a bit more attractive for people to um, to want to join promoted a bit more and and of course this is um, doing that so that people um, know all the good things that Rotary does um, because we do tend not to um, promote ourselves very well we do a lot of good good work in the community but we don't always tell everybody about it and um, and the Martin Fairs are an example of that um, you know probably half of Wairapa doesn't know that South Wairapa Rotary run those Martin Fairs and that all the money we make from those fairs uh, which is, you know, hundred thousand a year that goes back into the community through the grants that Paul was just talking about to the um to the, the, the school bursaries, grants to the food bank. I think we've given about five thousand to to the Featherston Food Bank this year and another five thousand odd to the Forikaka um centre in in, in Martinborough. So all those things that we do, we rely on the money from the fair, and so we need to make sure we have money um, to be able to do that. And we need to be a modern club that people want to join because you know, we do make money from the fair, but um, there's a lot of work goes into organising those fairs and um, uh, the preparation for them. That's probably a six-month job, just doing the preparation for the fairs. And then all the work on the ground on the days, um, um, there's a lot of work involved, so um, and so we need people to do that. So we need club members to be able to do that. So uh, and preferably young club members, <laughs> because some of that works quite hard. Well, it's not hard, but it's um, um, you know when you're in your 80s, it can be a bit difficult. So um, so so there are a couple of there are the two main things looking to do this year: modernise the club a little bit and to um, um, put our um, finances into a slightly more secure position than perhaps they they have been. And how am I, how am I getting on with all that? Well, yeah, <laughs> halfway through the year, <laughs> and um, th as I say, you only have a year, and then somebody else comes along and with maybe different ideas, And um, but we're, we're getting there. One of the other things we are looking to do this year is what we've started off calling um, a, a, a a flagship project, a legacy type project. In other words, a big project that we can put most of our money into um, each year. One that will go on over several, well, into the future. Um, that we can support something that um, um, that we can do in the community that um, will be known as a rotary project in the community. Most of our money tends to go on small, sort of one-off type projects, but we're looking to say, OK, let's put a large chunk of our money into a big project um, that will benefit the community, not just on a one-off basis, but um, into the future as well. So so we're doing a bit of work on that as well. So, OK. All right. Thank you. Um, so I was talking a couple of moments ago about initiatives throughout New Zealand, the different... Uh, clubs around the country that have done some stuff and I've got a little video here, a couple of videos actually, of uh, what's been happening 
um, nationwide. And one of them is the com uh, a COVID type response uh, from the from a club in Auckland, from Gulf Harbour, Army Bay area in Auckland. And we'll have a bit of a look at that. We had our own COVID-19 uh, issues, of course, when we um, suddenly couldn't have meetings. And um, when you've got quite a close-knit club, uh, who are used to meeting uh, weekly, and a lot of our meeting is around uh, the social aspects uh, of clubs as opposed to just working. And so it's a bit of a wrench to say, I'm sorry, guys, you can't, uh, guys and gals, <laughs> you can't just, uh, you can't meet. So uh, we split the club up into um, uh, zones, areas, uh, so, so that uh, people could look after each other in their own little local areas. Uh, and they were also tasked with looking into their local communities to see what COVID-19 type problems uh, emerge. Of course, having not been there before, nobody knew exactly what was going to happen. Uh, so the challenge was to keep our ear to the ground in each of our local areas. Uh, the thought was that it would probably, probably be close to home. Things were going to be happening in our local districts with our people, our neighbours, and that Rotary was in a unique position to help. Uh, and that worked uh, quite well. We had some good local initiatives where the club, the uh, segments of the club, the areas, uh, decided to help various sections of the community, whether it was the, uh, say, the Forikaka, um aged care facility in um, Marnborough, or whether it was uh, frontline staff at uh, 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 supermarkets and so on. But here's a little uh, uh, story about a COVID response from the uh, Army Bay area of Auckland, if I can get this going. Right. And again, Mike might tell me this. A public call for volunteers to assist anyone in need due to COVID-19 went out on March 25th, 2020, just as New Zealand went into level four lockdown. This became known as the Gulf Harbour Army Bay United Against COVID-19 Support Group. The public response to the call was overwhelming and Rotarians from clubs around the Whangaparoa area offered to help. Using Rotary's organisational skills, brand visibility and credibility, we quickly developed a committee with clear goals and leadership. This allowed the group to gain official support, develop teams to safely deliver services and manage communications between volunteers and those in need. We also developed working relationships with the Police, District Health Board and Whangaporoa Response Group. Within the first 48 hours, we created volunteer role descriptions and sourced volunteers from expressions of interest collected during the initial public call. Within the first 72 hours, a group and Rotary branded leaflet was created, printed and distributed. Within 96 hours, we started receiving the first requests for assistance. The group fielded requests daily during lockdown and periodic leaflet drops ensured that those needing assistance were aware they could receive it. The Rotary coordinating team operated from home as they were in the stay-at-home age range. 50 younger volunteers shopped for those unable to safely get to the supermarket under lockdown. The coordinating team ensured that volunteers knew what to buy and where to deliver it. They also ensured volunteers were reimbursed. Service recipients were contacted after a service cycle so we could check in, answer queries and, if necessary, offer a referral to the DHB or Age Concern. Service recipients frequently expressed gratitude that someone out there cares. Several have donated to Rotary. For volunteers, the ability to help people who really need it was a source of tremendous satisfaction. The project has been a huge success on all fronts. It offered positive community visibility for Rotary, attracted support, and laid the groundwork for increasing our younger membership. All right, thank you. Well, that almost worked. It was a little bit rocky, but uh, that's all right. I do have a couple of other videos along, along those lines. Um, which will uh, tell us a little bit about what people are doing around the traps. Uh, for instance, there's the um, Rotary Youth Initiative. Um, they've done, they did a, a virtual program um, because, of course, of, of COVID and so on. Um, 
And uh, so I've got a little bit of a clip here about the 2020 COVID-19 um, or the, co the 2020 RIPEN camp and how they went about it. Uh, but um, uh, in the meantime, while I set that up, so we're not doing it while you're watching, <laughs> Brian's going to just tell us a little bit, talk to us a little bit about our youth awards that we had recently. Brian. Right, well, we have each, well, every second year, every two years, we have a, um, a youth awards where we, um, we call for nominations from youth. I think the youth we define as anywhere between um, 5 and 25. Um, people who, who display the rotary sort of principles, I guess you would say. We're not looking for necessarily outstanding achievers um, in, you know, at, at school in terms of um, their academic achievements or sporting achievements, but we're looking for people who who display the rotary principles of serving the community, helping people in, the, in their community. And so we have it, that every two years. Um, the alternate year, incidentally, we have our, what we call our community awards. And so I guess it's the same thing, but it's for older people, um, recognising people in the community. So the Youth Awards, you just you just let me know, Paul, when you're ready to go. <laughs> the Youth Awards this year, um, I think we awarded them to... Um, I'll just run through the names. John um, Bayon, um, Michael Fletcher, Henry Isaacs, Charlie O'Connell, Anna Suto, Joshua Wigman, and Lauren Wigman-Peters. And, um, and we, um, we had a big, a big ceremony down at um, Featherston. We had a um, guest speaker, um, and he presented the awards. Um, he was, um, um, his name was Gulid Meyer, and he's a Somalian uh, refugee, and he's a young guy, lives in Wellington, and um, he's been in the news quite a bit lately, um, one way or another. Um, he um, founded the Third Culture Minds, an organisation called Third Culture Minds, um, to help young people with an emphasis on mental health and well-being. He came here from Somalia um, via all sorts of places I think a um, long way around the world to get from Somalia to New Zealand um, but he, so he, he promoted this company called Third Minds Third Culture Minds um, focusing on mental illness which is a bit of a taboo topic um, in, in his um, African culture and carries considerable stigma so Gulid spoke about um, some of the people who had inspired him enabled, enabled him to unlock his leadership potential um, and for example um, in helping to change um, New Zealand's refugee policy to remove the ban on people from Africa and the Middle East his advice to young people was to search out mentors um, and to be prepared for, uh, for whatever life throws at them um, recognising that um, life will, always, uh, will not always be a smooth ride uh, he urged the young people to um, reach out and congratulated them before he presented the awards um, to those people I read out before, so so that was our um, youth awards. Fantastic! All right, thank you. One comment I might make on on that was that uh, three of the recipients, Charlie O'Connell, Anna Suto, and Joshua Wigman, set up a company, uh, a, a website called TechWise New Zealand. It was aimed at assisting people to connect with each other, and they ended up uh, working with uh, citizen, senior citizens and helping them get connected together, uh, mentoring them in the use of technology, which I thought was an excellent initiative for these three young people. And I'm just so impressed with the, with the kids of today. It's, it's really good. Very encouraging. Anyway, I talked about RIPEN, what we call our little acronym, the Rotary. RIPEN, Rotary Youth Program of Enrichment. Uh, so it's an annual leadership development weekend for secondary school students. And in 2020, COVID-19 made a physical camp impossible. So a group of Rotary actors and uh, Rotary youth leaders, graduates, put together an online substitute. And this explains this successful initiative. Hello, my name is Grace Castle and I am one of the District 9920 Ripen coordinators here in Auckland, New Zealand. 
today I'm presenting on behalf of the 2020 program and the fellow coordinators Gabe and Claire de Guzman, Henry Thomas Kiercher and Aini Kwok. So here in Auckland we run RIPEN annually for high school students aged 16 to 17 and this year the plan was to increase past RILA participants or RILARIANS leadership on the program. Alas, the program didn't end up happening as we'd planned this year and so the point of today's chat is to explain how we adapted our approach to still provide a program to our RIPEN participants in the face of COVID-19. Monday, March the 16th was a long day for all of us here in New Zealand. It was the first day when things started uh, being cancelled left, right and centre due to COVID-19 and that evening our team of five had a meeting scheduled and it was inevitable that we would have to make the call to cancel. However, during the one or two hour phone call we discussed the possibility of instead of cancelling it outright, replacing it uh, with something else. So we asked the question, what if we didn't have to give students more bad news and more opportunities being taken away from them? So from this discussion, Ripen 2.0 was born and we got to work drafting up a questionnaire uh, to send to students asking them what areas of leadership they would like to improve on. We were transparent throughout, acknowledging to the students that this had never been done before and that they would be instrumental in designing their own learning experience. From their answers, we created an online leadership curriculum of six modules, which were all topics they'd expressed interest in through the survey we'd given them. Between our team of five and our wider District 9920 RILA cohort, we had, despite our young ages, a wealth of knowledge on these topics, offering individual insights, leadership models, self-development tools and personality tests, all of which the RIPEN high school students found really helpful and valuable. RIPEN and RILA programs across both Australia and New Zealand are now moving their programs online this year, and our RIPEN program has been somewhat of a catalyst we didn't intend for it to be all those months ago during that phone call and we just wanted to provide something for students instead of an outright cancellation. But the idea has spread to us giving multiple presentations to Rotary Clubs across Oceania over Zoom of course and it's incredible to see our work having a wider impact not just to the RIPEN participants themselves but also to the development of RILA participants and consequential impacts that it's had on Rotary networks and programs across Oceania. From here, we are contemplating our possibilities to take this online program further to other students or Rotary programs. If you have any inquiries or remarks, we'd love to hear from you and our contact details are now on the screen. Thank you for your attention and on behalf of Gabe, Claire, Henry, Aini and myself, Kaki Te Ano from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Great. Well, that was interesting. We lost the video a couple of times there. But I'm getting used to it slowly. Uh, so, uh, Brian's just going to uh, introduce the next thing. Thanks, slides, John. And um, thank you. Which is... Uh, on our playlist there. Right, so the next one is um, the Nandi medical bus. Um, this was a, um, a, a mobile health uh, project uh, in, a, in partnership with um, many others in Fiji uh, to provide free medical services to outlying communities. Um, we also had a, um, a Rarotongan um, a similar bus um, that um, we sent to Rarotonga um, a couple of years ago and that was pretty much a, a wire wrapper project particularly um, the South Wire Wrapper uh, uh, Rotary Club uh, and association closely with um, I think with um, transit bus uh, transit coach lines and they sent a bus over there with um, all, all with all the medical gear in it and it went round and round Rarotonga um, that loop road in Rarotonga and uh, took medical just uh, a sound check facilities to the um, to the locals basically and this is similar to the Nandi bus um, a lot of those facilities in the islands are, are, are 
not quite isolated, but they're a long way from um, from the um, the main hospitals, for example. And Rotary tends to focus on the the Pacific Islands when we're looking overseas to um, to to um, for aid projects. Um, we we pretty much focus on the um, the Pacific Islands. Um, there's always a few um, hurricanes um, in the islands that um, cause um, all sorts of havoc each year. And there are lots of other things. And Paul was talking earlier about water projects and just getting clean water. You would think these places have would have plenty of water, but they don't. And, um, and getting clean, um, healthy water is a um, big issue. Anyway, Nandy Bus. The Nandy Mobile Health Clinic Project is an example of a values-based partnership with two organisations, Rotary and Ramakrishna Mission, working together to achieve a life-changing and sustainable outcome. I would like to acknowledge the invaluable contributions of the Rotary Clubs of Harbourside Auckland, Nandy and Papatoto Central. Non-communicable diseases are rife in Fiji, with rates of illnesses like diabetes more than 10 times those in New Zealand or Australia. These diseases not only impact quality and length of life, but also economic and social well-being. The Ramakrishna Mission operates the Saranda Medical Centre in Nandi, Fiji, providing free health services. The need for mobile health services had long been identified by the mission working with the Fiji Ministry of Health. However, neither party had the money for a vehicle. We reached out through our Rotary Club of Nandi, who connected us to Ingrid and her club members. It was very, a very natural fit because all, both of our organisations are geared to the same ideal and mission and vision of saving people. With more than 100,000 New Zealand dollars and guidance supplied by Rotary Clubs and businesses from Auckland and Fiji, a vehicle was sourced and fitted out as a clinic in Fiji and was on the road in early 2020, briefly interrupted by COVID-19. The clinic is a preventative health service out in communities that otherwise would not have ready access. Services include early identification and education as well as initial treatment and medication. More serious cases are referred to clinics and Nandi Hospital. Community health workers in each location are key members of the team and the clinics are held in local schools and churches. Take up of the services has surpassed expectations. From the 1st of July until the 13th of August, over 1,900 people in 31 communities, settlements and villages have been seen. In the 20 to 60 year age range, approximately 50% were identified as at risk. The Nandi Mobile Health and Intervention is an example of a values based partnership with two organisations, Rotary and Ramakrishna Mission, working road. together to achieve. Okay, so that. <laughs> we can go to the fair. <laughs> yes, that didn't quite work at all. My goodness. Um, okay, so just moving right along. <laughs> Um, now we were going to also, well I'll try and figure out uh, how to work that, uh, just while, uh, are you able to talk about the fair for a second? I can talk about the fair. When did we set the fair up? It was in 1970 something or other, 70, anyway, 43 years ago. 43 years ago. So 43 years ago the um, South Wairapa Rotary Club started the Martin Fairs, um, and it was based on an idea that one of our members had seen when he was travelling in Germany, I think it was, um, these community type fairs and he thought it would be a great way of raising money for the community. So 43 years ago we started the fairs. Um, there's one, in, as the locals all know, there's a fair in um, first Saturday in February and uh, the first Saturday in March. And um, we raise money through the fairs. We we organise the fairs, and the 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 people who the um, stallholders that come along, they pay us a couple of hundred dollars um, for the honour of being there, and um, and that's where we get our money from. And we organise the where they go, and we organise power and water and all the facilities that um, you need for a fair these days, toilets, 
traffic management plans, and a lot of organisation goes into it. But um, but this year, I think we've got 500 stall holders. Is that right, Paul? 500 stall holders, and um, and I think we have something like. I mean, I don't know that we've ever done an account of the people who come to the fair, the visitors, but I th we generally talk about 30,000 people coming every year to the Martinborough Fair. And they come from all over the um, the lower North Island and, and some of them from further afield. And um, a lot of groups come down, they make a day of it, and uh, it's a great event. Um, and as I said earlier, we've been lucky with um, weather and COVID-19 and all those sorts of things. Um, but... Um, great event um, 30,000 people and that's where we make our money the stall holders um, pay us a little bit of money for the privilege of, of coming and the stall holders love coming we have a waiting list of people who want to come to the fair we um, we try and ensure that we have quality um, stalls rather than um, maybe some of the cheaper type ones that you see around the place but um, it's a great day. It goes all day, pretty much. I think, you know, I'm up at about five o'clock in the morning, <laughs> setting up, and that's on the Saturday. I would have been up early on, on Friday, marking out the um, the sites and the square as well. But um, then the store opens. I think at eight o'clock on Saturday, runs till till about four, and um, it, it, all the locals will know. Huge stream of traffic coming into um, into uh, Martinborough, and it's and 500 stalls, so there's a lot of uh, options in terms of buying things, a lot of food stalls, uh, a lot of craft stalls, and um, and so it's, a, it's just a great event, and we do it twice, once in uh, February, once in March, um, and um, and then we um, we all have a rest after that, <laughs> particularly those who organise it, because it, there's a lot of organise, organising involved in that um uh, and and the um, and, and getting 500 people in the right spots, um, and all that sort of thing. So uh, I don't know that we've ever had a problem. Um, we have a few weather issues in the past, but otherwise it's, they run smoothly, and um, they're just great community events. Mm. One year we had to um, knock it off, uh, postpone it. We postponed it until May, so that was a little bit of a drama. Um, but worked well. The store holders, uh, resilient as always, uh, just rode with it. Some of them couldn't make it in May, and they just said, look, hang on to the money. We know where it goes. It goes for a good cause. Uh, this year, with COVID on the horizon, maybe we may... Yeah, fingers <laughs> crossed. As Bryce got his fingers crossed. Uh, we may uh, uh, not experience any problems. Uh, however, just in case, we have a ring... We've put a ring around uh, April the 10th, uh, for a possible fallback, so if one of the days or either or both of the days are uh, can't go ahead because of COVID, we'll move to the tenth. Um, but we're hoping now, looking at the international scene, that there'll be a few vaccines around. Certainly, I think New Zealand can be proud of its record uh, that we have kept our borders fairly watertight. Um, uh, so. Yeah, it's looking good. It's looking good. Now, I have figured out how to make this uh, video work, I think. So I'm going to give it another crack. So uh, just uh, let's have a look, see if we can get it moving. Andy Mobile Health Clinic Project is an example of a values-based partnership with two organisations, Rotary and Ramakrishna Mission, working together to achieve a life-changing and sustainable outcome. I would like to acknowledge the invaluable contributions of the Rotary Clubs of Harbourside Auckland, Nandi and Papatoto Central. Non-communicable diseases are rife in Fiji with rates of illnesses like diabetes more than 10 times those in New Zealand or Australia. These diseases not only impact quality and length of life, but also economic and social well-being. The Ramakrishna Mission operates the Saranda Medical Centre in Nandi, Fiji, providing free health services. The need for mobile health services had long been identified by the mission working with the Fiji Ministry of Health. However, neither party had the money for a vehicle. We reached out through our Rotary Club of Nandi, who connected us to Ingrid and her club members. It was they are very natural fit because all, both of our organizations are geared to the same ideal and mission and vision of saving people. 
With more than $100,000 New Zealand dollars and guidance supplied by Rotary Clubs and businesses from Auckland and Fiji, a vehicle was sourced and fitted out as a clinic in Fiji and was on the road in early 2020, briefly interrupted by COVID-19. The clinic is a preventative health service out in communities that otherwise would not have ready access. Services include early identification and education as well as initial treatment and medication. More serious cases are referred to clinics and Nandi Hospital. Community health workers in each location are key members of the team and the clinics are held in local schools and churches. Take up of the services has surpassed expectations. From the 1st of July until the 13th of August, over 1,900 people in 31 communities, settlements and villages have been seen. In the 20 to 60 year age range, approximately 50% were identified as at risk, requiring follow-up and intervention to prevent their conditions worsening. We are very happy to inform that the bus is out on the road five days a week with the medical team provided by the Ministry of Health and supported by our own staff at the Sharda Medical Centre, seeing between 50 to 70 patients daily. Now, this is even beyond what we had originally expected, but we are very happy that it's very successful. The response uh, from the people of the community, from the government has been very, very encouraging. And we feel very happy that this is a very successful and uh, fruitful partnership. The mission and the ministry now run the clinic, staff it, maintain the vehicle and provide regular reports. Rotary and the mission have built a partnership that we plan to continue, providing early intervention services that we take for granted to people who otherwise would not be able to access them. We would like to thank the Rotary Clubs for their wonderful support, financial and technical in various ways. It has been a joy working with you and we hope that this partnership, the support from the Rotary Club to our medical services in Fiji would continue. Okay, I think that actually worked and we've got a full video in. <laughs> Uh, so that pretty much brings us to the end of our program and I'd like to just hand over to Brian just to tell us a little bit of what's happening at the end of our year and uh, uh, on into the new year. Brian. We, um, we traditionally wind our year up with um, Christmas carols at um, Whare Kaka um, um, Rest Home down in, um, in Martinborough. Uh, we go down there and we sing carols with the um, with the residents and we have a a drink and something to eat with them. Um, that's actually on Wednesday, I think it is. And then we um, then we go around to um, Brackenridge and um, we have our what we call our Christmas party. It's um, it's a, just a grand meeting, I guess, that we have. It's um, it's a nice spot there, and it's a nice um, place to just have a drink and talk and um, and a nice meal. And I think we've got a speaker as well. We've got somebody from um, the Nico Foundation coming along to talk to us. Um, we usually have speakers at our meetings. So that's it. That winds up our year. Um, and then we have Christmas and New Year like everybody else. And then we start again um, with a, um, a, a barbecue in, um, in January, late January. And then, of course, we are straight into the fairs, the two fairs. So, um, so, um, so we have a bit of a break and then we, um, we start the year with a bit of a bang with our two big, um, two big events, the fairs. So... Um, so it's like everybody, I guess, it's been a long 2020. It's been, um, we've had our issues, as Paul said before, um, not being able to have meetings. We had a lot of Zoom meetings. We all learned about Zoom, and I guess everybody knows about Zoom these days. Um, but, um, but it's been a long year, but it's, um, we're nearly over. And um, it's, I guess it's still been a successful year for all of that. Um, um, and um, then we look forward to a new year, so um, which um, starts off in, um, as I say, um, late January. Um, so, um, so I guess it's thanks to everybody who's helped out during the year. Paul, in particular, who's done a lot of work on the Martin Fairs and organising last, no, the next fairs coming up, and um, and to all our people that have done a lot of work um, um, over the over the course of the year. 
and um, who are all looking forward to um, working hard at the next um, next Martin Fairs. So, uh, so we, um, I think that's it, is it, Paul? Um, that's yep, that's us. So I think we'll uh, say it's goodbye from me and it's, it's goodbye, from, goodbye him, from him and it's goodbye from all of us. <laughs> Thank you.